Welcome everyone, Happy New Year. Welcome to this uh, first talk in 2022. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Oana Andre, uh, who is a lecturer at uh, the University of Glasgow. Oana uh, studied uh, for her first degree in uh, Romania uh, at Bucharest and in Iași, and then moved to Inria to uh, do her PhD in 2008. Afterwards, she uh, moved to Glasgow and uh, she has held various positions um, until she got a permanent position at uh, the Formal Methods Group uh, in Glasgow, which is a very exciting group, uh, by the way. And uh, she's doing uh, lots of very interesting research on uh, probabilistic methods um, for the formal analysis of systems. And she will talk today about the application of such methods on uh, uncovering and interpreting interaction styles. Uh, Anna, thank you very much for having joined us. Uh, just uh, for the audience, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want to appear on the YouTube recording, you can always join as a guest with uh, a different name. And uh, if you don't turn on your camera, it should be fine. Juana, thank you again. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's an honor to present my talk at the Variability Seminar. Yeah. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about our um, um, applications of uh, formal modeling analysis to uncover and interpret interaction styles in interactive software systems. So this has been a um, uh, joint work, long time of joint work with um, Professor Mafi Kolder from University of Glasgow, uh, and Dr. Alistair, Alistair Morrison and Professor Matthew Chalmers, all from University of Glasgow. Why I make, made a pause there is that because me and Mafi, we are from formal methods background, whereas Alistair and Matthew are from um, an HCI, human computer interaction background. So it's been um, a very interesting um, and fruitful experience to work alongside them. So first it was um, in a program grant called a population approach to Ubicom systems design. And uh, then we carry on working myself and Mafi um, as main um, uh, actors, we say, on this work on the science of sensor system software uh, program grant, both program grants uh, funded by uh, UKRI EPSRC programs, uh, EPSRC in, um, funding bodies in the UK. So this has been a work started, let's say, almost seven years ago uh, with a lot of explorations, as I was saying, uh, trying to um, create a bridge, I say, between our formal methods experience and um, interactive systems. Um, so we were looking in particular at computational modeling in HCI. We wanted to see how people interact with uh, software in the wild, in real life. We wanted to see what characterizes software usage, how can we model usage in a heterogeneous population of users. Then how can we identify and characterize interactions or usage styles and how they change in time? So some example software, what I'm um, referring to is, uh, for example, mobile apps. Let's say we've uh, initially looked at a, a mobile game, Hungry Yoshi, um, and then we focused more on this third one here on the right, App Tracker. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it uh, more in detail in this talk. And um, there's another game app that we, I'm started, uh, I started to look uh, at with some students, more recent one developed uh, by uh, students and uh, um, members of uh, the academic staff here, Alice uh, Miller, she's present on that, um, RPG Light. Okay, so. This is a type of software looking highly interactive. Uh, users are using mobile apps in various ways on their day to day life. So what we've been working on and developed, crystallized over the years is a temporal usage analytics where we want to evaluate user intensive software application with one aim would be to redesign them. So what characterizes them is that they are highly dynamic because users use them differently in the morning, in the evening, on a train or working from home. Um, and we weren't looking just at, we weren't looking at demographic information like how 
let's say people in the UK use some app or uh, how they use it, uh, the app in the weekends. We wanted to look more broadly at the usage. So for that, we were looking at statistical methods of inferring usage um, styles, interaction styles, and analyze them using probabilistic model checking. So first we took information from um, these mobile apps. We instrumented the systems to log um, the usage data because we wanted to understand how users use them. So this is a um, diagram of our temporal usage analytics. So I will walk you through it. We start with uh, instrumented software. We have some way of uh, logging usage of the button that's on the app. And download them all onto a server. And then transform all this data into time series data. There's a lot of cleaning as well involved in this uh, um, creation of time series data. Um, then if we want to look at how usage changes in time. So we want to select some time intervals of analysis and segment the data accordingly. And then we feed all this data into um, um, inference algorithms, just computational statistics model, not uh, nothing more fancy, to create some probabilistic models. Then we're going to have some temporologic properties probabilistic temporologic properties um, to analyze these models. We do model checking. Uh, for us, it was PRISM, the PRISM model checker that we use, and then we get some results, lots of results. And with these results, we wanted to characterize, um, I say here, activity patterns. We want to characterize the interaction styles. And I'll get, uh, and then we wanted in the initial stage, wanted to get some an evaluation of the design. We were working with uh, HCI people in, in interactive uh, systems. There was a lot of arguments, <laughs> discussions, and then we got to some design recommendation. And yes, we had for one application, the app tracker application, two iterations that ran from 2014 to 2019. 2014 being the year where the app was uh, developed in uh, in the project and released into the wild. And uh, then uh, we ran this temporal analytics uh, to evaluate it, released the second version in 2019. We gathered the results and uh, um, had some uh, uh, initial uh, uh, conclusions. So let me just take you through to one look of this. Uh, diagram here. So first of all, let's see what the user trace means for, for us. So we like to see from um, a user, we'll see the device ID, which you conflate with a user, an individual user, when they first access the app, when was the last time they accessed the app, and then we'd have sessions with the timestamp events. And events would correspond to some button tabs. There was a thing, there was a lot of work of cleaning and preparing uh, the log data uh, to a reasonable format like this and uh, fixing all the errors uh, from the logging infrastructures. And then we segmented the data set because we wanted to do a longitudinal analysis. We want to look at the first day of usage compared to the second day of usage or the first week, second week, second month, third month. And this choice of time intervals really depends on the application. Uh, depends on how much you know that people are using an app in, in uh, like every day. If it's something that people would use like twice a week, let's say, or a few times, I don't know. Uh, it makes sense to look at uh, segmentation based on weeks or two weeks or months. But if you know it's something like the weather or I don't know, Facebook, uh, you want to see like usage um, uh, every day. So we said, okay, let's model the software usage in a population, user population. So obviously it's probabilistic. It's, um, so we looked at statistical models 
uh, for generating um, for the different generating processes of such uh, populations of uh, heterogenic um, heterogeneous and dynamic uh, usage. Um, we based on 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 previous literature um, thought that Markovian models, especially hidden Markov models, um, be a good uh, model for the software usage. And uh, what's more important is the admixture aspect of uh, these models, because individuals would have different styles of usage or patterns of usage, comparing to morning, after lunch, or in the weekend, depending on the location they're in. So this is one of the let's say, most technical slides of this uh, talk. I'm going to try to keep it as uh, light as uh, possible to not lose uh, many of you. Um, so this is just a comparison of the models we've been, we've been using these models at the bottom. So these ones at the top would be uh, an execution trace in, in a discrete time Markov chain, a first order Markov chain model, where you have a time interval one, you have some value for a variable y, and then it changes in time. Now to um, move to hidden Markov models, we'd have hidden states or latent states at each step, takes a value, and for each hidden state, we'd have a, a corresponding observed state at the same time, inter, uh, time, time step. One model that we've uh, explored and um, have some, we published it in one of the earlier works is the admixture of first order Markov chains, where you st still have um, this hidden uh, state X, but the transition, probabilistic transitions will only be between the observed states. So we, um, settled to the first order autoregressive hidden Markov model. While we have, we have transitions, probably see transitions between um, hidden states, and we also have transitions between the observed states. And let me show you an example, more concrete example in the following. So what we call activity pattern, I've already slipped and um, mentioned it earlier, or in other words, usage style or interaction style, is in fact for us a discrete time mark of change over the observable states. And observable states are all those um, data states we see in the user trace, uh, all the button tabs we see in the data, log data from coming from the users. So in this example, let's say we have a discrete time Markov chain. We have four states, Y0 to Y3, and probably six transitions between them. And what I'm showing here, the thickest, the thicker the arrow would mean the higher the probability will be associated to that um, transition. So now if we move from activity patterns to the first order autoregressive hidden Markov models, that we called generalized probabilistic admixture model, GPAM for short. So we have here in each box, we have an activity pattern, a discrete time Markov chain. We have another one here. So let's say in our model, we have two activity patterns corresponding to the hidden variables X1 and X2. So inside here we have the observed state, but now we also have probabilistic transitions between these um, activity patterns. You can have self loops or transitions from one pattern to another, because you want to see how users change their um, interaction style in time. What's the probability to change the interaction style, right? But uh, say here, yeah, we have the same, I use this, um, <laughs> colored circles here to say that we have the same observable observable states in each activity pattern in here, and we have transition here. So how we inferred these models? We used um, a Baumwelch algorithm, which is a nonlinear optimization expectation maximization algorithm that 
uh, classical algorithms in computational statistics, for which we give as input a number of user traces, some example we've seen earlier, a number of observed states, in this, this case would be four observed states, and uh, k being the number of hidden states. In this example, we say only two hidden states. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize is mixture and admixture. Admixture is a word that is not that often uh, encountered. So just to make a difference, why do we keep saying admixture? So this comes from um, genetic research, so genetic mixture versus genetic admixture. In a mixture, each individual in a sample here has a probability of one or zero or one to be you know, from the population, the blue stars or the red stars. So in the mixture, you either have, have blues and reds, right? But in an admixture, each individual in the sample has a probabilistic distribution over the initial population. So we have this purplish star will be, um, I don't know, 45% blue and 55% uh, red. I don't know exactly how you get that, but something like this. Okay, so we've inferred the usage models as first order uh, autoregressive hidden Markov models, which we call generalized population admixture models, GPAM for short. And we get something like this. Let's say we had um, 16 um, observed states, get this nice representation, graph representation of the um, DTMCs, had some very thick. Um, transitions here with high probability, some very thin with very low probability, some pro some transitions don't exist at all, let's say between 2 and 12. And we see for one model, for one data set that these patterns look different. But what else can we say? What if we have 52 states? We had some data set. What can you say about this? when you just look at them. So we said, how can we uh, analyze these usage models? I'm going to use probabilistic temporal logic properties uh, with rewards if needed, so that we can reason over individual activity patterns because we want to label, to characterize them in some way. So these are some examples of properties we used. One is uh, the probability to reach a state J starting from the initial state within n number of time steps. Or visit count is a reward-based property. What's the expected number of visits to a state from the initial state within n steps? And for example, if we look at the state end of session, this will give us the average uh, number of sessions. Another example was is step count, which gives us the expected number of steps needed to reach a state. How many button taps until reaching a particular screen view on your mobile app? And if we're thinking about uh, the end of session state, um, this will give us the average uh, length of a session. And we can also flatten the GPAM that big autoregressive hidden Markov model into a discrete Markov chains so that we can use uh, um, our favorite uh, privacy model checkers prism to reason over the behavior while changing patterns in a whole uh, model. So for that, we can look at properties that range over both observable and hidden states. For example, what's the likelihood in a state J in one pattern to change to another pattern within the same session or to lead to the end of the session. And we also looked at the long run probability of being in each pattern. And then the problem is um, computationally. We have to compare the results across states, patterns, and uh, uh, longitudinally for all the data sets we created. So let's uh, stop here with the going through the diagram of the 
temporal logic analytics and look at uh, the case study, uh, the app tracker app, which is a personal informatics mobile app developed by Alistair Morrison, one of the authors um, in, uh, in our project. So what this app was doing, well, that was back in 20, developed 2013, 2014 for iOS. It was tracking usage of all apps on the device. And he was pretty good with that when he saw that uh, Apple introduced screen time, which is basically this really, uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. So this app will give you stats and charts about your usage on the phone, and how long did you use um, mail for the past week or so, or on a particular day, um, and so on. And this app was running in the background, uh, had over uh, 35,000 downloads in uh, the first two years. And um, we selected uh, a bit over 300 user traces for analysis over the initial three months of usage. So just to say, we weren't looking at what exactly this app, was showing. we're not analyzing the stats and the charts the app is showing, but we wanted to see which buttons the users were pressing on this particular app. You see what they're looking at overall usage, what they're looking at last seven days or select by period, what, what uh, and settings and so on. Yeah, so they had other, like what they're pressing these buttons, looking at the average of the day. Let's see, you can select usage, you can drill down into more specific stats. Um, about usage like daily, how did it change or weekly or monthly? So first of all, we we selected when the app was designed, it had already uh, integrated um, logging infrastructure to log all the um, users actions um, with ethical approval. Everything was done correctly. And from all the states, we selected the most important we designed, the most important together with the designer. So we had um, 14 states from the app and we added uh, two new ones for you start, you stop to delimit a session based on some information we had in the data. And we grouped these states we're gonna see later into like summary states that we see on the main screen and more specific states when you drill down into the app and look into specific uh, uh, information. And then we inferred um, models, usage models for the first day of usage, first week, first month, second month, and third month. And we looked at um, models with either two activity patterns or with three, with four, and with five. And even with this, we've got 20 models. So let's see how, for example, we had um, a similar pattern uh, from three different time intervals. You see in the first month, if it would look like this, and in the second month, it changes. Again, we see some transitions kind of disappearing. And uh, in the third month, again, slight difference, very slight difference uh, from the second month. But we also had uh, this uh, this different perspective on looking for one model at the the transitions between uh, patterns, activity patterns for the same um, data set for the same model. So we had three activity patterns, three usage styles, and we had probabilities, transition probabilities of moving from one to another. For instance, here we didn't have anything from Activity pattern three to activity pattern two. Okay, so we applied policy model checking. We've got for 20 models, we got loads of results, tables. This is just one, some nicely uh, laid out tables. Um, trying to use some colors to visualize uh, results. And uh, there was a lot of work to interpret these results, to compare them across 
states, data sets, uh, like longitudinal, first week, second week, and so on. Well, it was not first week, first day, first week, first month, second month, and third month. And here, if you see there, like, these are the probable, but I'm not going to spend too much detail on this, but this is how we had pages and pages of tables. And to interpret these uh, results from problems model checking, we used inductive coding, which is similar to, so we use an, an interpretation of qualitative data based on uh, um, this paper by David uh, Thomas on inductive coding. And we aggregated all the results into tables, as I showed you, used colors to categorize and order the rows to select which states to look at. Some are less important, like terms and conditions, who you who checks terms and conditions more than one. So uh, that was not something to include in the interpretation of results. And part of the inductive coding, we wanted to come up with labels for these activity patterns with uh, uh, textual description associated with them. For example, we got to have like glancing summary, focusing specific or browsing specific, as you're gonna see in the next slide. And this work took a long time and just painstakingly, there was several revisions, refinements. Um, there was a lot of, uh, had to do uh, consistency checks, like independent parallel coding, so two people analyzing the data, uh, check the clarity for uh, categories and going back to the stakeholders, the designers, to check with them if we got the labels right. Uh, so we decided to start the coding after lots of uh, back and forward um, based on the usage intensity based on the session length and counts. That will give us how long is a session uh, and how many sessions it have in one pattern. And then look at the states, um, the predominant states in a model in an activity pattern. Like the higher the probability to reach um, uh, a state in one activity pattern, then that state would be more predominant in that pattern. But if you had many um, uh, the probability, or the expected uh, um, reward to visit a state in a pattern, if it's high, very high, then the state is uh, predominant in that uh, model. So, for example, when you get this label for a pattern, browsing summary, which says that for browsing, the sessions are fewer and longer, they are centered on states at the top level menu, and summary would be um, a state grouping from um, uh, decided in, together with the app designers. So after a lot of work on the inductive coding, then we also used uh, James natural breaks for optimization to decide on these uh, categories like we have for the usage intensity. We had glancing sessions or glancing, uh, um, glancing patterns, activity patterns, where you had many short sessions, just like glance on the phone, or browsing where the sessions were long, very few, and the B behavior um, corresponding to looking at the top level menu. This is a hierarchical menu we had in the app. Or focusing would be like mid mid sessions and states from a specific group um, when you're looking in the, into some details of the app. And then we had the uh, state group categories. I think I've shown them here. Like here we had like summary states and some specific states here, and then the you start, you stop. And this way we identified four activity pattern labels. So this is an illustration here for the first day of usage. If we look at two activity patterns, we saw those 
One is a glancing specific, so glancing at some specific states um, that shows more um, specific stats about the usage, and then browsing summary, so browsing at the top level of the app. And in the second, uh, in the first week, it's about the same and the first month. But then as we move in time, so in the second month, it's kind of like people are more used to the app. They know what to get from there. So they're not browsing as much. They're not just uh, looking at the um, in-depth statistics the app is showing because now they have more data in there to look at. So they're focusing more on, uh, they know exactly where to look in the app and uh, use it. So we see, um, so I'm, I'm brushing over lots of details about the app usage because the app tracker is because it's uh, gonna take too long then. Um, so what we came up to say is that in the early days, you have a lot of glancing, a lot of browsing, what is in the experience or later uh, periods of time you have more focused behavior. So I guess this is something you'd expect, like people are learning how to use an app at first in the first few days, weeks, and then they settle into more specific usage, more focused usage of the app. And then we looked for models with three activity patterns, and again, went through the painstakingly procedure of labeling um, and characterizing the um, activity patterns. We got some similar intensity categories, glancing, browsing, focusing, and this time we had six activity pattern labels. And we see here that um, we see some focusing summary in the first few days, in the early days as well, alongside glancing and browsing. So there was good reason to look for the activity patterns, right? And some more different um, combination of these uh, these labels. Okay, so now we have the labels for the activity patterns, and we can do something more. We can look at the probability of moving between patterns or the uh, long run probability of being in one activity pattern. And this is um, possible only because we're looking at autoregressive hidden Markov models or generalized uh, uh, population admixture models. So let's look here briefly at uh, models with two activity patterns. We see the probability of moving between uh, patterns. So from glancing, there's higher probability to go to browsing than the other way around. And this would be in the first day, the first week, and um, in the first month. Whereas in the later uh, periods of time, we have we see there's a very low probability to move between uh, patterns, which would mean that um, when people are using an app, will be one or another more like it. Not not much change between um, in their behavior. And again, we can do a similar thing. We're looking at uh, three activity patterns uh, as a probability. So again, um, high probability of moving from glancing specific to focusing in summary. And um, there are some interpretations you can go into more. I'm not gonna go into more details here. When you look at long run probability, in Japan, we see for each time interval here, the first two bars at the top. We see browsing summary is more prevalent than glancing. And if we look uh, um, again down here, we see, um, well, they're both focusing, focusing specific, so focusing on uh, very in-depth usage of the app, to say is uh, more prevalent than just uh, focusing on some um, top level states. And I can do the same for the other ones. So just to summarize now here, uh, what we've done for the analysis of the first round of uh, 
Map tracker. Oh, sorry. So we found out uh, browsing happens a lot in the early days uh, and focusing and glancing in more experience or later uh, weeks or months of usage. And we also identified that glancing are in fact micro usages, short uh, interactions with the app is something that uh, was already um, published by in HCI in communities, glancing behavior on in apps. And this is just a very brief uh, conclusion that I gave you here about the analysis. We had a, a bit more and we came up with ideas for redesign that would be more details in the papers. And the ideas for redesign was to go to redesign the app for more experienced usage, to encourage uh, the experience usage uh, for the app. So we had the second version of the app where um, we changed the main menu or the menu of the app with only two main top level options instead of three. Settings is not that important. And we wanted to align glancing behavior with summary states and focusing in specific. So we want to um, uh, support more focusing behavior or short uh, glancing behavior. Just to show you um, how the state diagram changed from one version of the software to another, we had some like we split up some states, we moved some, uh, some we kept in place. This would be the specific uh, the, uh, in green box or the specific. Uh, uh, in that state. So now we've done one loop and we had design recommendation, implemented it, and then released the, the app in uh, uh, two users in the second version. And we went around again the temporal usage analytics loop. This time we had 600 user traces for App Tracker 2. I'll spare the a lot of the details of the analysis. Now, just to make a comparison from App Tracker 1 to App Tracker 2, what was the likelihood of changing the patterns? So, yeah, we labeled again, we generated models, analyzed them, uh, used inductive coding, and labeled, characterized the patterns. So, at the bottom here, you see the patterns in different models in App Tracker 2. And what we see here, the likelihood of changing patterns from the first version of the app compared to the second, is that in the second version, there was less, less likely to change from one pattern to another. But if we looked at uh, three patterns, again, the probability to change between patterns is lower. Um, especially, I forgot what I meant to say here at the bottom. I think it was just like having uh, uh, we had one activity pattern that was there was no interact, no probably to change to and from uh, the others uh, into this um, focusing summary pattern. Now, if we look at the long run probability, again, a, a big change in here, we see that uh, the browsing summary had uh, very little prevalence in, in uh, the second version of the app. So there were less uh, browsing, and there was more focusing. And uh, again, if we look at model with three patterns, again, we see less uh, browsing in the second version of the app and more focused behavior. So in conclusion for the app tracker analysis, not, this is not yet the conclusion of the talk. Um, so we evaluated the effects of the redesign. First we labeled the interaction styles, activity patterns. We evaluated the effects of the redesign. Uh, we have a judgment about the redesign itself. And then um, we compared, uh, by comparing this, uh, the models for these two versions, we concluded that we obtained 
in the second version, more glancing across all time intervals and more focusing in experience than later models and variable browsing. And this is what we kind of aim to do. Is it a correlation causation is still debatable. So we also saw that there was lower likelihood to move out of an activity pattern in the second version of the app, which suggests a greater alignment with our intention of the redesign. So, um, so in, uh, all in all, this 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 work was um, of analyzing Aptaker and redesigning it and analyzing again was very exciting in that we tried to to develop and refine it iteratively along the way of formal analytics while also trying to meet um, uh, the experience and lived experience of the users, the software designers and the programmer. Uh, obviously, we couldn't keep up with the, the pace, the analysis pace so much slower than um, before really developing and releasing a new version into the wild. wild. So there are lots of uh, sensitivities of the analysis and validity issues that we tried to uncover and uh, um, mitigate as much as possible. So some of them would be parameter choices, like the states we're choosing, how we segment the data set, how we choose the number of K of the activity patterns, and the parameters we set for the inference algorithms, and also the temporal properties we're using. One other thing we're saying is the user groups. So when the app was released for iOS, um, it was released on, on jailbroken phones, not on the um, official phones, because Apple wasn't uh, didn't allow to track so much uh, sensitive information, and in the end they blocked it completely. We could not, even if you wanted to release a third version of App Tracker, uh, we couldn't have them. And one other thing is from one version to another, we could not uh, track the user. So it did not, which of the users for the second version also use the first version, which would skew some results in the way that the users of the second version were not completely new users, so they were already experienced to some extent. And also there's a demographic time of the year. Was it holidays? Was it um, uh, beginning of the year or is it end of the year that also changes the um, usage from one version to another or like in, in time. So we know we're aware that we need to, uh, to do more uh, case studies. So we've analyzed um, up until now two apps, uh, analyzing another one now. Uh, we need to see to test more interactive uh, systems, not just mobile apps. And uh, for this, we need more automation. And the problem is that we need more data, which is um, so tricky to, to uh, get these days. And another big issue would be the inductive coding, which is uh, there's a lot of uh, subjectivity uh, involved in there. And um, a lot of care needs to be taken when labeling uh, all this behavior. So overall, our um, contribution is how we use this a scientific approach to study an artifact, a uh, mobile app that we engineer, we design and um, release. And so in this case, the software system usage was the object, the object of the study, and we used probability temporal logic as a means of study. So this is an example of using computation modeling in HCI. Um, and uh, it's not just useful for design or, or redesign, but most of all to understand how uh, interactive systems are actually used. So for um, future work, we said we want to increase automation and uh, have a finer green visualization of analytics results. Um, still working on the visualization tool, but it, especially the inductive coding, it's it's so difficult to, to automize, automatize. Um, 
And we could complement this with uh, more qualitative methods such as like user interviews or focus groups for how people use the app, not just tracking their um, uh, usage data. We can get some um, insights from other models. There's a lot of uh, recent work on like for the past couple of years on neural networks and other machine learning techniques. We just use basic computational statistic models. And uh, as I was saying, we want to look at other case studies. I've already been looking at um, modeling social group interactions to label um, small group um, uh, meetings, interaction in small group meetings. And um, so that was successful. And then looking at the sensor uh, network uh, node, sensor systems. So just want to say in the end that um, the nature of this uh, ongoing, this is an exploratory research, it meant that we were not able to work to the timelines of uh, the software development process, which is usually fast paced, such as like the agile uh, development. So for this purpose, like all in all, yeah, some automation and some more um, testing in other case studies will help to see if indeed this temporal research analytics is useful in this form or needs to be changed, adapted, or something else. Um, I'll just leave you out here with this uh, diagram of the temporal usage analytics, and that would be me. Thank you very much for the attention, and I'll be very happy to answer uh, any of your questions. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, let's see whether there are any questions from the audience. Any questions? Please raise your hand, unmute yourself, or type it in in the chat box. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the uh, yeah nice overview and uh, for for this um, image here, where it's a good place to ask the question about um, which part do you think is most promising to be automated? Uh, because, for example, this instantiate the temporologic properties. Well, you could. I don't know, try to exhaustively do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't, on the other hand, um, the this uh, inductive coding, this seems really, really difficult to. Yeah. Automate. Yeah, it is. That, that's the trickiest part. I think uh, uh, there'll be, there won't be that much automation in there, but helping the inductive coders <laughs> um, by visualizing not just tables, because I was just looking at tables and tables and uh, try to make sense. Um, so something like uh, um, comparing uh, discrete time Markov chains, look at distances between discrete time Markov chains, that would be something helpful to like visualize and which one are the closer to another. In the, like in this, screen. This, this is one thing I was thinking of. So this would, this would basically mean that you um... So right now you were looking at the abstraction that the temporologic properties give you, right? Yeah. And you just you, a, just a, you're now suggesting that it's maybe better to um, ignore that and look more closely at the models themselves, or did I not understand? Um, this? I would say yeah, yeah. Um, okay. First, so one thing is first to look at. Wanted to investigate if looking at the distances between uh, discrete and Markov chains correlates with what I was looking at, the usage intensity, categorizing the results themselves. If any of this would be a better method. Um, so that's one thing. And other is just a better visualization than, than, uh, than tables. So uh, still don't know yet. <laughs> So it would it would be helpful to um, to run this again, and I have some students doing it for our data sets to get their perspectives on how is it going, what do they think is tricky, and uh, hoping to get some suggestions from them. Okay, thanks a lot. Good. Are there any further questions, uh, Effie? Please. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the uh, interesting talk. So I would like to ask about the context. So you talk about the activities pattern change, but how many contextual variable you 
you you have measured. So we tried something like this before many years ago. We even asked the user to wear a camera to take some picture or so-called um, interesting or critical incident. So afterwards, they, we conducted an interview, asked them to explain their, their pattern or the, why they use um, the mobile phone this and that way because of certain contexts. So have you also captured this kind of data and I, th I can imagine it can be also very difficult to integrate into other data together. Yeah, just curious to know more about that. Yeah, yeah so I we didn't. In short mm -hmm. answer, we didn't. We, so we, would, we should have conducted some uh, focus groups with the users um, when we released the app. Uh, um, and we did not then, which is a real shame because we can't go back and do it now because that was such a long time. So next time when we're going to do it, we'll be more careful to integrate this qualitative analysis, qualitative results to help us uh, with the interpretation of the results. Yes, yep. we just, we have mm -hmm. some numbers and we're trying to understand what was uh, the behavior, but really we... Yeah, but, but it, 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 can, yeah, it can be a very intrusive approach anyway. <laughs> so yeah, it's quite difficult, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah. so... But for, for, already, a small, yeah. for a small focus group that would complement very well to, to at least to get, to get some insight that would help us carrying the analysis in some certain way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you mentioned in the last slide about the future work, probably. So you're going along this direction anyway. So but very interesting to follow what you're going to, to do next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Perhaps I could ask one till someone. So uh, I think my question somehow relates to Effie's, but maybe from a different perspective. You mostly looked at time series uh, coding of your data. Was there a moment where you would benefit from some sort of active learning where you would ask the user to perform a certain task and then measure that to complement some data that you're missing in, in building models? Do, do you see any complementarity between passive learning that you have performed now to build mm -hmm. your uh, Markov, uh, uh, Markov models and uh, some sort of active learning where, where you assign tasks where you have some doubts about uh, the, the structure of your Markov model or the probabilities assigned? Um, yes, we thought about it. We thought about like uh, prompting some, prompting some users, some points to do some actions on the app. Um, but we did not. So uh, it's, um, is this what? Yeah, exactly. So I was saying uh, in active learning, typically you ask queries, right? So, so, so you yeah. post queries to the system. Mm -hmm. Here the, the system is the user, right? So uh, you could design some queries that would clarify some doubts about the model. Yeah, yeah, that we we discussed, especially with the HCI researchers. They wanted to do this uh, at some point, but uh, when time passed and uh, we were not able to do anything like to release the app again, um, to prompt some users have some control group uh, to say, would you do that and that or ask them some questions. Um, yeah, that would definitely help with the validity of this uh, work. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? We still have a couple of minutes uh, before we close this talk. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have uh, one more question. In the For the version two, uh, you said that it was again very, very work intensive to extract the um, the, the patterns in the end. Um, but I, I wonder if you, you already knew what the model was before and then you changed it, but you didn't change everything, right? Uh, so shouldn't things like, um, shouldn't there be like some similarities between the models yeah. and, and the data that you could use to, to yeah, make this? No, it was, yeah. Yeah, you caught me. It wasn't that much work yeah, <laughs> to do the inductive coding the second time because I knew all the steps I had to go through. So um, yeah, it wasn't that much. It was, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it was. Uh, um, it took some some time yeah, to do it. Okay, but but is there is there something that can be like systematically exploited um, or? Yeah. Um, Yes, it's, it's the um, yeah, very good question here. Yeah. Uh, 
let me go back into that mindset of bringing the impact of coding. Um, so I discovered in the first uh, round um, that a uh, good way was to look at the usage intensity and categorizing states, and that simplified a lot of the work for the second round of inductive coding. And uh, I guess some more things could be learned, little things that, that simplify the work. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, it wasn't that bad in the second part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe one final question, Simos. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Juan. A very, very interesting talk and research. So I have a similar uh, related question. So did you, after doing the uh, implementing the design recommendations, did you uh, experience any frustration from the users? especially the experienced one, because uh, I, I find myself many times when I, I, I get to know an app and then after a bit of time it is redesigned, I, I feel frustrated. So did you, and because I, it, it requires a bit of learning curve again. So did you find any similar experiences or? No, but I, I would agree with you that you'd get some users. It's, it's probably to do with the um, where we released the app. So it was released on jailbroken iPhone on Cida. It wasn't on um, the Apple Store. So people there will be I think, more flexible. And um, I don't think we followed up with uh, users to get some feedback. But I would like in in a more uh, systematic way of running this which is more this work was more exper experimental and exploratory my system like we'd, we'd follow up to see if because we said we are designing for experienced users did we in fact um, alienating them or uh, enhance their uh, experience uh, so that, uh, uh, that that would be the normal step to do in, um, in a systematic way yeah mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Very, very interesting research. Thank you. Okay, uh, so thank you very much again, Oana, for this very interesting thank talk. You uh, and, uh, and it relates also a lot to our uh, work package on, on user uh, experience and how it integrates to in autonomous, autonomous systems trust. Uh, so thank you all for being here. We will have another instance of uh, the verifiability talk in two weeks. I mentioned active learning, and actually that would be the subject of our uh, verifiability talk in, in two weeks. Uh, Fries van der Ranger has a new uh, algorithm for active learning, which is kind of a subsequent algorithm to Anglin's L-star, celebrate Anglin's L-star. Um, I think it's called L-sharp. It's, it's something very new. I think it's not yet even published. And we are very much looking forward to listening to him uh, in, in two weeks' time. Thank you all again and have a nice evening. Thank you.